experienced scriptwriters will advise, there is a framework to follow. And once you understand the script format and structure, you can then focus on being creative. Our session today will do precisely that. Whether you are a beginner or have experience with scripts, today's craft-based masterclass is aimed at scriptwriters and filmmakers of all levels. Our experienced and highly talented speakers will take us through the process of writing a screenplay, looking at the framework to kickstart your work, as well as the next steps to take that script to screen. That is, pitching, financing, and working with the actors to bring it to life. They will explain the process, give practical advice, and from their experience tell us, in hindsight, what they would have done differently. So I am here with our guest speakers, Jean-Pierre Magro, Trevor Walton, and Joseph Vassallo, who have all made it to the big screen. They will share their experiences and valuable tips they learned along the way. We will also find out how they have approached their particular style of script writing methods. So the first part of our masterclass today will set the scene. And I invite Jean-Pierre Maggio as our first speaker. Jean is an experienced scriptwriter and producer, known for Sandstorm, Hounds of War, and Blood on the Crown. He also wrote Bulgarian Rhapsody, which was Bulgarian's nomination for the Oscars in 2014. He is a guest lecturer at Exeter University and the London Film School. He also has a master's in screenwriting from the Edinburgh Napier University and a PhD in transmedia narratives. He has collaborated with Disney, Lego, and worked on the successful franchise Hitman. Jean, would like you to set the scene for us, starting from that burning question. Is there a secret formula or blueprint for writing for the screen? What structure should we follow? Uh, for, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me, but no, there is no structure, there is no recipe. The recipe uh, for writing is that there is actually no recipe. What people like, it's, it, it, it's different, it changes in time. Uh, when I started writing, we used to start thinking of a character and following a character. Now we think of a universe and you write about the universe, so there are quite significant changes. Uh, but the most, uh, the most important thing is that there are principles. First of all, writing is a craft. Uh, we, we, have, we have this impression, uh, probably came from France, that uh, we are all tortured artists sitting in some room, uh, typing at a computer, divine inspiration comes and you actually write a story. That's not really true. What we, have, what, what we really have is that we're talking about a craft, and the craft needs one, practice, and you need to know the rules of the games. If we have to make an analogy with football, uh, before Cristiano Ronaldo became Cristiano Ronaldo, someone had to tell him the rules of the game. You can't touch the ball with your hands. Uh, there is this offside rule. Uh, this, is how we play, this is how we play the game. So the biggest problem with writing that I've always encountered is that people uh, don't know the actual craft. And if you want, the art comes later, but first is the craft. And it's something that you need to know the principles of writing, which which are very easy to find out because they have been set, set uh, uh, quite, quite uh, early in life by Aristotle. If you read the poetics, there is already everything written down of what constitutes a good story. And usually you can, act, you can synthesize uh, a whole movie, whatever story you have, in just one simple sentence. My character wants something badly and is having problems getting it. Every film, uh, that, that is out there usually is about that particular sentence. If you can't dilute it to that sentence, then you have a problem with your story. So uh, there are these principles, and I always encourage people, read a lot. It is extremely <laughs> important to read screenplays. Uh, they are quite easily ready available online nowadays. It's, 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 quite, it's quite easy. Write as much as you can and learn the, learn the craft. If you have those three things, then you can move forward. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. We'll come back to you after we have spoken to the other two guests. Trevor, I would like to bring you in at this stage. Trevor Walton has had its scripted programming divisions for four North American television networks, CBS, Fox, Lifetime, and the CBC. 
He started his career as a talent agent in London and Los Angeles with personal clients, including Alan Rickman, Pierce Brosnan, and Rick Mayol. We asked him to join us to provide a practical, real-life perspective on how scripts make it to the screen, looking at the challenges involved in financing and getting the final product into the market. He will also talk about the importance of investing in and getting the story right. Trevor, my first question is this. How would a scriptwriter go about pitching to a network or investor? Should they look for commissions or should they pitch their creative ideas? Um, thank you, and thank you for inviting me to this. Um, so, there are lots of, lots of ways, anything creative as to how you move forward and get it made. The networks, each of the networks have a specific audience that they are trying to hold on to and to enlarge. And so for me, for example, when I went to CBS, they, looked, they wanted audiences that were in the, not from the big cities, but from little towns. When I went to Fox, what Fox wanted was male audience, 19 to 49. That's what they wanted. They wanted the boys. And then when I went to Lifetime, it was a television for women. They only wanted women of all shapes and sizes. So it was an interesting... And then when I went to the CBC, that was about families, family entertainment. So my point is that you have to understand to whom you are pitching your project. So if you went to Lifetime and it was a story about two brothers who, you know, had a terrible fight, you'd go, it's probably a great idea, but it's not going to work here at Lifetime. We do movies that have a female protagonist. So you really have to understand to whom it is that you are pitching um, and the kind of audience they want. And does your story that you have a desire to tell match with that audience? Then... The idea of, in television, of just saying, hey, I've got this good idea, I think it'll turn into a, a good TV movie or mini-series. There are a lot of steps before you get to that room with that executive who's tired, who's had a pitch at 10 o'clock and had another pitch at 11 o'clock and then there was another one at 12 o'clock and then there was one at 2 o'clock and you're the 3 o'clock pitch. And how are you going to make that exciting? How are you going to make that executive sitting behind the desk go, ah, that's the one we want, that's the one we must buy. And, of course, that always starts with one thing. However, it's a passion. Do you have the passion to do this? And more importantly... If you are pitching something, and the moment that it actually goes on the screen or is aired, can be many, many months. Do you have the passion to keep going through all those ups and downs, all those script changes, all those moments you thought you were going to get the green light and it didn't happen, and then they wanted this big star and the big star didn't want, whatever it may be, do you have the passion and the energy to get to the finish line? So for me, being on that side of the desk, that was always the first thing that appealed to me. This person knows what they're talking about, they're excited about what they're talking about, and they're open to, to the collaborative experience of making it fit the needs of that network. And so it was always interesting, if you veered a little way away from the story they were telling and just ask a tangential question and they didn't know anything about it, and you go, okay, maybe they don't know their subject so well. But if they go, oh, it's so interesting, you asked me about that. Yes, yeah, well, they were, we couldn't put it in the script. You go, oh, this is the kind of, this is the kind of thing we want. Um, it is lovely to think, and I know writers that are able to do this at their point in their career to just sit in a room and have this idea and, and create something. But the likelihood of that writer then just walking into the network is very small. Mm -hmm. Producers get involved, other people, development executives get involved, commissioning editors get involved. And so my second rule of thumb would definitely above and beyond passion is be able to go with the flow. 
You're not sure about that note. You're not sure you want to make that character a female or a six-foot you know, wrestler. But if that's what they really want, let me see how I can make that fit in this process as opposed to, they're crazy. That can't possibly happen. You know, I'm not going to do it. So it's about a collaboration. It's about being able to go with the team um, to get to that finish point of all being able to see their, their, their fingerprints on the f finished product. Have I talked long enough? No, it's, it's, okay. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you, Trevor. My pleasure. Um, let's see everything now from an actor's perspective. So I invite Joseph to join our conversation. Joseph Vassallo needs no introduction as an actor. A Maltese-born American actor, he has worked in television and film. He has appeared in numerous plays, commercials, TV shows, along with several films. Joseph, my first question to you is this. As an actor, how do you approach a script you have been handed from your agent or a friendly scriptwriter you know? Yeah, first off, thanks for having me. It's such an honor to be here. Um, that's a good question. <clears throat> Most of actors in Los Angeles don't get a script right away. We get sides. So they're very discreet these days, the networks especially, to hand out upcoming episodes on script for confidentiality reasons. So we get sides. So if you're going for a guest starring role, you're looking at 12 to 15 pages of sides, two, three scenes of auditions. And what you have is a piece of the pie. You don't know the setup of what scene you're gonna be reading for. You don't have much information, only what it is in the scene heading and the scene description. So what I do usually is, we as actors, we see the writing on the page, and now it's our job to bring those characters to life. Give them a life. It's not about memorizing lines and shoot lines after you hear action. There's a lot of work involved. And now every actor has their own way of doing it, their own box of tools, and everybody is great, but I can maybe share how I go through the process. I read the sides a couple of times, and um, many times I don't know what the setting is. It might say, interior living room, night. That's it. And then the description, there's no description of furniture. It's not like you're reading a play. It's a different mm -hmm. story. So I kind of get my imagination going and set myself up the setting. So I put myself in that living room. And I imagine the TV set over there, what kind of TV set does he have, the rolling chair, the couch, where is everything? I put myself there. I try, I get a piece of paper and I try and derive as much information as I can from the script about the characters, my character and the other characters in the scene. Where am I coming from? What's the circumstance, see? And I ask questions, why am I here? Why am I coming here? What do I want from so-and-so? Who is so-and-so to me? Is she my wife, my ex-wife? Is he my friend? Is he my father, my mother? What's my relationship to them? How do I feel about them? Do I like them? Do I hate them? Because that will change the tone and the approach to, the, to meeting this person. None of this is in the, in the sides. I kind of write a bio for myself. So I create a life for myself and the characters around me, unless it's already in the script, then it's very helpful. But when you have an audition, you don't have all that information. Remember, you don't have the script. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I break down the script, I break down the scene, um, the beats of the scene, and I always want to say, what do I want from the scene? What do I want from this other actor I'm reading with? Say, from John. Why am, what did I come here? What's my objective? Am I able to walk away from here unless I get what I want? So the goal is to empathize with this character, you know, to either love them or hate them or, or, or envy them. You just give them life. The writer has done his job or her job putting these characters on the page. Now it's the actor's job to give them the breath of life so when you're on screen, people are mesmerized and they're connected to you. They can empathize with you. They're rooting for you. How many times do we see the bad guy being loved on screen? 
because they're doing a great job. They have a good thing about them that we're seeing, and we're still almost rooting for them, even though they're the bad guy. So anyhow, so that's how I go about bringing the word from the page onto the screen by doing a lot of research, a lot of homework. And I go through that process, and the audition is such a peculiar place. It's, I never used to like to audition. I gotta be honest with you. It's not a friendly environment. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Especially for the actor, man. Nobody's going, hey, how you doing? If you know the casting director, yeah, they know you. But you, re you really go and you drive from Santa Monica to Burbank on the 405 freeway. It's an hour drive at 3 o'clock, and you, know, you get there, you're struggling to find parking, you left your <laughs> job, and then you see all the other actors waiting in line as the usual suspects, the people you audition with, and, uh, and then you go in and you got one, two minutes, you know, hey, how you doing? You do your thing, thank you very much. If they like you, they have you do it again a couple of times. This is the first call. But then you get a second call at the producer session, we call it, when the producers are in the room and the director usually is in the room. It depends on their schedule. And um, one thing that I used to do, which was a mistake, I used to go and audition to get the job. These days, I don't do that. Brian Cramston says something brilliant. He said, show them the character you created. You understand? So instead of going to get the job and having that desperation inside of you, it's work on something great. Show them the character you visualized and imagined according to the writing. Don't be afraid to be different. They're looking for something different. They've been sitting there all week casting, and they keep seeing the same thing over and over again. Be a breath of fresh air. They love that. Now, the audition process has changed. Now we do self-taping in Los Angeles. We no longer go to the studios because of COVID. What a freedom that is. I got my own setting, my own lights, my own everything. My wife reads with me. It's fantastic. What I do is I send in two, three takes, different ones. I send a take I think they're expecting, but then I send another take, my kind of take, my version. And I don't call them auditions anymore. I feel like I'm going to work in production, and this is a take of this scene. So I don't I put that pressure on me. I have fun doing it. And once you're, doing the, you're done with it, you walk away. You have no control after that. You send it out, the producers, the director, there's so much that goes on with casting. It's not just about your talent, you know? And you, you let it go. You've done your thing. Have fun doing it. Have joy. It's your time. Milk it. Own it. Mm. Give it to them and walk away. Thanks a lot, Joseph. Very interesting. My next question is to you, Jean-Pierre. How important is it to understand your audience when writing a script? I think it is crucial. You, you can't write anything without knowing. Uh, the same way, the same way as a dressmaker understands the body of a woman, you need to understand who you're speaking to. And it would be pointless me doing something that I want to sell to a particular audience and they don't like it. Or, or at least I can't even show it to them. Uh, at the moment I'm working on a project and we were talking about uh, the, 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 the ratings. Will it be PG? Will it be PG-13? Will it, will it, will, will it be even higher? And we're, debate, and we're debating that, knowing that our audience is usually 14 to 35. But still, you need to see where you're going to place uh, certain scenes within, uh, within, within your structure. I think, I think it, is, it, is, it is very important. And there are so many examples. I had a friend of mine, and uh, when I was doing my, my PhD on transmedia narratives, uh, she was working for a publishing company. And they wanted, to expand, they wanted to expand the story. So they decided to use iPads. And the story was aimed at uh, a female audience of housewives. And iPads had just come out. So it, it was obvious that those iPads, because they were expensive when they came out, actually were, 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 were not that common within a household. But usually it is someone, uh, either a businessman or a businesswoman, who are buying it initially. Telling the story on the iPad was completely idiotic in a certain way because your target audience did not own an iPad at that time. So these things are, are, are crucial to when, you are, when, when, when you are actually building your narrative. Because what's the point of building something and then not having an audience to show it to? Thank you, Jean-Pierre. 
Trevor, my next question to you is this, and it's a very important question in my estimation. How would a scriptwriter go about working out the budget and raising the finance? Well, I may not be the best person to answer that because um, from where I was sitting all those years, I had a certain amount of money that I spent <laughs> on products because it wasn't a question of, oh, shall we make this or shall we not make this? It was a question of, we have to make 20 movies. We have, to, you know, these have got to be on the air every Sunday throughout the season. So my role was always, I want to, I want to make something. I want it to fulfill my quota. And so we had a split of about 70-30 where we would provide about 70% of the budget and the rest of it was raised uh, by the producers. Um, but I worked with um, a very good novelist called Clive Barker who was very successful with the adaptations of some of his projects onto, onto the big screen horror, horror pictures. And, and he always used to say, you know, I would prefer to have one great shot of this character, Pinhead, or whatever it may be, that will stick with the audience and they'll go, oh, it's such a great, it's such a great character. And if I've got a small budget, I know, for, for me, the creation of a character that's going to stick in the memory is the important. That's where some of that money must be spent. We're not going to skimp on that. So there are other things that could quite easily, um, this big outdoor scene that needn't be, it could be an interior. We don't need to have a, um, a, um, uh, you know, a, a large cast around it. We only need two people in this scene, whatever it may be. So prioritizing what are the important aspects. So, with television series, what happens is they, if they're successful in America, then they get made all over the world. And other companies in other Malta, Spain, Italy, they buy the scripts. They buy the story and make their own version of it. And there's a person at the network that says, OK, what is your budget? Well, these are the things that we want you to make sure you keep in your version of the show. Even though you have less money to spend than we did, these are the essentials. These are the things that must be seen. Otherwise, you know, we, we, we won't let you, you know, have this franchise. So that's a very specific mandate of these characters need to be in it. We need to have a shot of, you know, a country house because we always have country houses and whatever it may be. Um, and, um, and then, of course, the other big, I could go on for hours about it, but of course, another big issue is casting. So if you have a situation where you have a piece of casting that the network says, this will make the difference. We'll green light this movie if you have dot, dot, dot. If we have him, if we get him, then we'll make the film. And they go, well, my God, he's incredibly expensive. And you go, no, he's the only person that we want in this film. And they go, okay. So if he's, Joseph, so expensive, then we're going to have to cut our cloth according to what we're left over with. So maybe that character we thought was going to be a name that we could sell the film with. No, we've spent all the money on him. We're going to have to have a lesser name, but a good actor to play this role. And so casting makes a huge difference. And I've but, and I think there are lots of lots of features in the couple that can be identified now um, that, you know, it's a small budget film and a big, big actor is starring in it and has a producing credit. So they get, you know, more fee for that. And everything else is skimped. Everything else around that movie has been diminished because they're spending, spending so much money on a box office name that's going to make the difference internationally. And those are very, very difficult choices to make with a budget. But, you know, it goes on and on and on. But there's a couple of examples. Thank you, Trevor. Joseph, is there any measure of control from an actor on the scripts he decides to accept? Or is it just a decision taken by his agent? No, he has the control to say, I want to do this project 
but I want to pass on it. Actors in Hollywood do that very often, in fact. Big actors. And they do it for whatever reason. Sometimes conscience matters, they don't like the script, they don't like the director. There are many reasons why an actor would pass on a script, and the agent, if they see potential in that script that's going to further the career of their actor, of their client, they're going to try to advise them to rethink their decision. The agent is there to advise their client and to steer them the right way. But an actor has the right to say, um, I don't want to do this. Now, let's back up a bit. If you move into Hollywood and you don't have a resume, you don't have a demo reel, the rule of thumb is do everything that comes on the table. Because you need to build a resume, you need to build a demo reel. Everything today is with a demo reel. An agent won't see you unless you have a demo reel, unless it's a small boutique agency that is working with non-union and union actors. But if you're going to the major leagues, I want to know your guest starring credits, your guest starring roles on tape, at least, and so on and so forth. So you need to work. Now, if there are certain things you don't want to do in your career, like I have a couple of things, make sure you tell your agent what they are. You don't want them to go pitch you and go through all that hard work they get you the audition, and then you say, ah, I don't want to do that. They won't like you for it. But um, yeah, the actor has, has, has the right to say, yes, I do this, or I don't want to do this at all. And, um, but for the new actor, they should be open to whatever so they can stay current. Remember, another thing, agents don't like it if we turn work down. Remember, they're in the business to make money. This is show business. This is something they don't teach you in acting school, that this is a business, and there are politics in this business. So the reality is an agent sees you. You're a product. You're a brand. They're looking at dollar signs when they see you. How much money can I make off of this actor? So if you make it a habit to turn projects down, they're going to terminate your contract and replace you with another actor who can do the work. So there's a fine line there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joseph. Jean-Pierre, I want to ask you a question about trends now, in the sense that should a screenwriter follow trends or create their own? And what is a trend anyway in the film industry? The, the, there are always there are always trends. Usually, usually, I mean, as Joseph was saying, it's a, it's a business. So if something is successful you will find uh, so many copycats coming, coming around. So there will be producers who will be asking that, uh, executives asking for that particular genre at the moment because it becomes successful. So you see all these, all these copycats uh, going on constantly. But uh, as a writer, I think, I think I always advise people, find your voice. Of course, uh, same as with an actor. If you want to work regularly, you should be able to, to work at, at any genre and, and anything. But of course, uh, not everyone is able to do that, but it goes back again to craft. Are you able to, to do this kind, uh, this kind of work? I mean, I was lucky that I was for a number of years head of development in an American company. So the stuff with, that we used to produce uh, was always very different. So I was involved in every single, in every single genre. And my job was just to, uh, find the product, develop it for, for the screen together with, with, with writers and be the in-between between the producers and the, actual, and the actual writer. So you end up working on everything, on every single kind, and that helps you grow. Now, not everyone is comfortable doing that because you still find this resistance that some think it is just art. I think art uh, comes later. First get the craft, then you move to art. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Um, Trevor, my next question to you. You actually already answered it because I was going to ask you about compromising on, on the budget. <laughs> so um, the question I have for you is an alternative one. Obviously, producers, like agents, as Joseph said, look at profitability mainly. So how would a producer know if a script is profitable or if it will bomb at the box office, for example. I know there's no sure way of, of knowing that, but... 
Everybody here can write down the formula and go off and make um, successful movies one after the other after the other. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, I think everybody that spent a, um, a lot of time in the industry, one of the joys is that there is a magic that's involved. And so I was thinking of one show I, I went to the taping of a show and it was fine you know it was all good and the audience was sort of enjoying it and then there was a a young kid who was playing one of the children in this piece and they were just fantastic and everybody immediately saw it's like oh this show isn't about this family this show is about him he's who what's his name where did he come from and so that's always a great moment because then you go, okay, well, then we, we need to start thinking about this. We've, we've created something special here and, and we need to, um, you know, redress the balance. Um, I think you can also, in my life, which was a lot to do with the edit of a movie, was sometimes you don't know what the balance is of the film until you see the first rough cut and you go, oh, how interesting. That's not sort of where I thought this was really taking us. But isn't that interesting? The the romance is so much stronger than the you know, the other aspect of this. Oh, that's something that we should all be aware of because that's beautiful what's going on there between those two performers that you know, the audience let's spend as much time as we can with them because they're they're such a treat. So so I like the idea that there's a magic uh, that's involved and always that magic is about if I like this, I'm hoping the audience will like this. Oh, this felt special. I bet the audience will get a kick out of this. And of course, you know, a lot of the time it's out of experience and you go, oh, I think this is such a wonderful idea. And then, you know, you air it and you get letters saying, I was absolutely outraged. What a terrible... <laughs> you go, oh, okay, well, we won't do that again. So there's a, you know, a lot to be learned along the way. Thank you, Trevor. Joseph, another question for you. They say, don't make a bad movie as bad movies don't sell. <laughs> In your case as an actor, how do you recognize a bad movie from a good movie? And obviously a bad script from a good script. Mm. Yeah, good question. It, again, it starts with the script. The writing on the page. How many times do you go see a film or pick up a piece of literature? She's talking about books. I love books. You just can't put it down. Same thing it was screenplays. You either read the first 10 pages and toss it, or you think, okay, I'm too tired, but I'm going to read a little bit and see if I like it. And you end up reading the whole thing because it's such a page mover. It moves so well, you can't put it down. An actor knows a script. This is a great script. Sometimes it's not a good script, but it's got potential, and the actor sees that potential, and get some creative um, license to be involved in the writing to help make it better and so on and so forth. So it starts with the script. Also, you know, actors consider who's directing the film. You can have a great script, a bad director, it's not gonna gel. So actors, you know, also look at who's directing the film. You can't really tell if a film is gonna be a blockbuster or an Academy Award player. It's good to know what genre you are getting into here. If you're looking for financial success and you're doing a melodrama, you know, melodrama are usually contenders for the Oscars or for the awards. That's where the meat of the work is. But then you do a sci-fi film, you hardly ever see a sci-fi movie with actors being nominated for an Academy Award. But they draw a huge audience to the box office, where it's a moneymaker. So it depends, as an actor, what do you want to be known for or for this particular project? Is it f as a blockbuster for the money or is it for the, you know, to, to, to be a condenser for the awards and whatnot? There's so much that goes into it. At the end of the day, you know, a project, you can put the, a great cast together, you can have a great director, a great team, you can have a great script, deliver a terrific project. But at the end of the day, it's in the faith of the marketing department. The marketing department are going to do their best 
to bring a huge audience to see your film. Nothing is guaranteed. How many sleepers have we found, have we heard of through the years that became massive hits? Nobody knew about these films. They were small films that made a ton of money in the box office. And then there was another movie that had a lot of hype behind it, a lot of marketing, and flopped. Really, you have no control of how it's going to do in the box office once it goes out there. The best thing an actor can do when choosing a movie is, you know, the script, uh, do his homework, like we discussed earlier on, put his heart and all his energy and his acting is hard work. Don't be fooled when people say, oh, it's so easy. If you put the work, it's hard. It's long hours, too. Long hours and it's dedication, man. And, uh, and, um, but again, you can have a huge team. At the end of the day, it's out of your control. You hope for the best. Thank you so much for the three of you for uh, this very interesting session. We are now opening um, uh, the discussion, and uh, we are giving the opportunity to the floor for any questions uh, they may have. So please, if you have any questions to one of our esteemed guests, this is your time to, to ask them. Yes? Would you write a script for... Wait. Wait. Would you write a script uh, that and how you imagine to be edited or leave the editing for post-production. For example, starting the ending in the beginning and go back in time as a flashback or something like that. Is it directed to me? Uh, uh, mainly you and Trevor. I think, I think you write it as you would want it to appear on screen. It's never the case. Uh, whatever you write always changes. As soon as you give your screenplay to a director, he's going to bring in his own thoughts. If you're going to have actors of a certain caliber, they're going to want certain changes. And then you're, you're going to have infights between, between actors. And there's so much politics. I mean, I think Joseph said it. There's a lot of politics and a lot of management. It's not that just you write a script, this is what I imagined, you place it there and it's going to be done exactly as it is written. It's never the case. It always changes and changes because of, of many things. Uh, I'm, I'm always reminded of, of one story. Uh, Akiro Kurosawa, uh, he, di he directed a film called, called Yoyimbo. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's basically, uh, it, it, the opening scene is about a samurai walking in the middle of a road. And I think there are 88 theses in the world about that scene. People describing that scene, why did he place the, the character in the middle of the screen? Uh, is, is it because he wanted to show him as a bully? Is it because he doesn't care about things? Or somewhere writing saying no because the character was afraid because there, are, uh, there is grass which is really high and he's afraid that there is someone, some thief hidden in, in the grass. So there are all these considerations. Uh, before he died, there was a retrospective uh, at Venice Film Festival, and he was blind at the time, but he attended, and someone asked him, a qu asked him this question, why did you do it in that manner? And he said, because there was an airport on this side and uh, a hotel on the other <laughs> side. So uh, unless you are exactly within, within the production, there are so many changes that happen. And, and you don't even have a control of. So, so it's a fluid thing. The, the script is a blueprint. It's a blueprint to attract actors. It's a blueprint to attract finance. But as the production goes, it starts changing. And sometimes it changes for the worst. Doesn't mean it always changes for the better. You just have to fight for a vision. But that vision has to change. It has to do with money. It has to do with politics. It has to do with so, so many other variables. That's the reality of... of of the business. Trevor, you want to add something? To... I think he said it all. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Anyway, yes. I, uh, again, um, script to screen. You've written a script in Malta specifically um, about a Maltese subject. How do you get that to screen? Because it's, it's good talking about, you know, learning about taking it to CBS and NBC and so forth and working in Hollywood, but specifically in Malta, which is obviously a very, very different industry 
to what's happening in the US, how would you take your script to screen in Malta? A lot of tears, uh, hard work. Uh, what, 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 actually, what actually happened with Blood on the Crown, uh, I had been working in this industry for 20 years in, in, in screenwriting. Uh, it's, uh, I've, done, I've done courses, I, I was head of development, I actually produced films in London as well. So when I returned back to Malta and I, I decided uh, to establish myself here, I always wanted to see an indigenous industry. So I was always very much interested that we have something to say. And uh, I was given, uh, th there, was, there was a call uh, for a screenwriter for, uh, for, this, for a project about the Sette Junio. And I applied, uh, I was selected. For, 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 for this thing, and we started thinking and discussing, because it wasn't just uh, uh, something that was just about me. I mean, I was just supposed to be the writer, I wasn't supposed to produce it. And uh, I, 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 they were telling me we need to be ambitious. So I started saying, okay, this is the money that we have, what if I go to my friends and to other people together with my colleagues and try to raise money? And in fact, we raised one million for 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 that project, uh, and it's it was it was a gamble in reality. See if we are able to do it. Uh, I, I I use the experience that I have to say, okay, if we are going to sell it, and it has to be in Maltese, uh, because it's a story about Malta. It would be pointless doing it in English. We know that's going to be an art house film. How do we go about trying to get a bit of attention? So the idea is, okay, let's talk also about the, uh, the British side. How, let's get two actors. So I started sending the script to agents, uh, seeing with who would apply, who, 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 would, who would answer. Uh, and we were lucky in many cases, even with, the, with, with actors. Uh, I think I had seven or eight big names to choose from. And they were calling me so that I choose them. Uh, we were also lucky with the director. He was a friend of mine. I've known him for 16 years. And I knew that if we want to, to, do, uh, to develop the, the, the industry, I mean, we have, to start, we have to start from somewhere. It was a very ambitious project. But with the idea that, listen, uh, if we prove ourselves, we can actually start building something. It's pointless just talking about what, what can we do, unless you actually start doing it. And all you need is one success, whether it is Lutsu that was at Sundance, whether it is uh, Blood on the Crown. One success will lead to creating other successes, because uh, this is an industry uh, where, which is made on networks. It's about who you know and where you know. So I always believe that if I know something and some, I can help someone else, I will do it, because that's that's what can make us stronger, stronger together. So, uh, to, to really answer your question, it's a lot of hard work, but using the experience that I, that I, I learned before when I worked in the States, when I worked in, in London, and trying to apply it to, to this reality. And it's a, it's, it is a very difficult reality because the infrastructures are not there. Can you, can you put Could you have raised, you know, the, that sort of uh, finance for the film? No. Could it have been made? You, no, you had to have the names too. Of course, to... of course. <laughs> definitely no. Definitely we wouldn't have, No one even would have looked at it. Especially a film, a film in Maltese. It's a language spoken by, by half a million people. It, it is very difficult to go there and say, I want, I want, to, I want to do a film in, 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 this, in this language. Even, even the director, I, mean, I, I wanted at first uh, to have a Maltese director. But I knew that to get that finance, I had to provide, uh, first of all, uh, I had to provide a director that would be approved by financiers as well. A director that would be approved by the actors. So it, it's, you have this politics that, that goes around. It's not just that... Uh, uh, you can just go and do a film. I, I, I saw a comment recently on, uh, on, on, a, on a portal that said it's funny that a Maltese film about Maltese independence with so many foreigners. 
And my thing is, we are not there yet, unfortunately. I mean, I would like that we are there, but how do you raise money if you don't have those names? How do you raise money if you don't have a director that people, that those financiers will trust? Yes, we have to start from somewhere, and that's why we need an infrastructure. We need an infrastructure that works, that is really geared with, with, with a vision that, that it's in the short term and in the long term. I, I just hope that blood on the crown can serve as a template so that it's, it doesn't stop here, but other filmmakers are invited to do, uh, to, to do such stories which, with, uh, in participation with government. I mean, that's, that's my, my, my wish. Because I think it is important that we tell our stories. We, I think we are the only country which one doesn't produce documentaries, which I think is, mm. is obscene. Because documentaries are, it's like having a photo album with no photos. They should be, they should be done. And if you want to train directors, you do it through documentaries. If you want to train writers, do it through documentaries, that's editors. That's, that's where you start learning, because they are cheaper, easier to sell. Yeah. Much easier, much easier to sell and to have an international, uh, an international resonance. And then we start building towards, uh, towards uh, feature films. But then we also need to function and having the proper infrastructure. We want to have writers, writers who, uh, and, and when, when I say that, it's not just dreamers, dreamers, people. I, I meet so many people tell me, oh, I, w I have an idea and it will be a great idea to do a script. Fine, write it. Mm -hmm. And they don't write it. And 10 years later, they're still talking to me about that idea that they spoke to me 10 years ago. You have to learn how to write. We need critics, real critics, because that's how you improve. So learn it, people who know how to, how to be critics. And not just, uh, because I don't like it, because it's not to my taste. That means nothing to me. Criticism actually helps you grow, especially academic criticism. It is extremely valuable to have it, that you can sit down. And, and have this, this, this exchange where you are actually challenged. So, so all, the, all these things, I think, will eventually... Uh, we, are we, are, we are fighting upstream, but I think a lot of progress has been done. I mean, this year there were three movies, or last year, last year it was three movies during the pandemic that came out, which is quite good. But we have to continue, which it can't be just one year, because the problem is that if I'm writing and it takes me five years to write another script, I'm losing, I'm, I'm losing something. If I'm directing and it takes me another five years between, between, I'm losing something. Look at the German model. The German model, the television station, uh, the, the, the government television station, national station, they have this project called Tatort, which is a cop show that happens in every single uh, different, uh, in, in different German cities. And it is intended for writers and directors who are in between jobs, so that they don't lose the sense of craft. So, and and it, is, it is quite successful. But at least they have a vision that's saying, okay, uh, you might not do a film every year, but at least in between, you're not just flipping burgers, you're still continuing on your, on your craft. And I think those are essential. I, 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 I don't profess that we should reinvent the wheel, what I always do is I sit, look what's around me, and try to take as much as possible. Denmark, for me, is the model that we should copy. If you look at the success that they had, what, what did they try to achieve? They brought University of Southern California to Denmark, and they said, we need to learn how to write. That's our weakness, first and foremost. And it took them 10 years, 15 years, of constantly Having, be, having, first of all, having lecturers being trained in, in, in that methodology and having courses. That created uh, a, whole, uh, a whole cohort of great writers. What they are doing now, they are exporting to, the, to America. Because they use Denmark as the test base. I create a product, I show it to the Scandinavian kind. Of course, they have a bigger market than we can have. But they are testing that story and then they ship it to America, and they sell the rights uh, for, uh, for the remake. It happens all the time. But they had a plan, and the, and the plan was lo a long-term plan. And I think that is a great model. And if you have a great story, what they showed us with Dogma, especially, 
was that you don't need fancy explosions and stuff to attract an audience. If it's a good enough story, people will talk about it. Well, I just wanted to add, it's so interesting listening to you, and I absolutely respond to that idea about documentary, and you're right. When I was in Canada, one of the things that was so brilliant about the Canadian system was that they had pumped a huge amount of money into documentaries to record their stories. Not, fancy, But this is who we are, this is where we've come from, this is where we're going. Absolutely wonderful idea. The second thing I just wanted to pick up on, and the reason that I'm sitting on this panel today, is because I live here in Malta and very, very happily working alongside a, a, a renowned film director and, and an academic to create the Malta Film Academy, which is a, uh, an educational um, uh, institute that we're creating here for Maltese people as well as international students. And we're going to start this summer with a with a summer program. Um, but, and I just wanted to pick up on the last thing that you said about a multi, just a Maltese story. I'm not sure that's the best way to look at anything. It's just to say just a Maltese story because all stories carry the same roots with them. So if it's about two Maltese people having a lovely time in Gozo, and it and it and it says something that will say something to audiences everywhere. So never think of, oh, it's just a Maltese story. And the other thing is that Malta has an incredible, it's this, you know, Malta is a country of contradictions, and we won't get into all that, all the glorious things about Malta. But one of them is that 52 weeks of the year, people seem to be making films here. But 52 weeks of the year, local Maltese people seem to be sitting around going, gosh, I wish I was a part of that. And these weren't people just coming and going. So definitely what we want to do with storytellers and with, with people that want to be behind the camera uh, or, or, or whatever it may be, that we can work and create this um, academy that's specifically about all of that uh, and really trying to invest young Maltese people with the idea that, that this is a viable business for them and they could actually have a living doing it and stay on the island, I think would be a lovely thing for a lot of Maltese to believe could also, be possible. What they did that was right, which I admire about what you did, and I speak as a producer and a writer as well, have my own project, but what you, see when you go to a distributor or a, an investor, um, the first question they usually ask, who's in it? They're going to ask you, who's the director? Who is playing the lead role? Unfortunately, Producers and filmmakers, um, they're always facing that reality. You might have a terrific story with great Maltese actors, but the distributor or even the investor is not going to bite unless there is a name actor attached. Unfortunately, that was, that, that, that's what makes it work. So I think what The Crown did that was brilliant um, is they had a great story. It had the political element that people understand. They don't know much of our history yet, but they will. It had two very recognizable actors in the film with a fan base that people can go and see the film because they're in it, and that's what a distributor looks for. And also it was part, partially in English, which I liked, because now you're catering. Unfortunately, if you're selling a film to the North American market, subtitled films, don't really sell as much or as well as fully English films. So I think with what they did with The Crown, having that reality, because I think Malta was British at the time, right? Right. So that was a reality in the story that they depicted and used to your advantage, I think, in terms of distribution, selling the film and attracting an audience. So all these intricacies, unfortunately, you're dealing with the business side of it, in the suits, the investors, the executives, they're always looking for the name. And that's the reality I think you had to face. Yeah, and even, even the, choice of, the choice of actors, it doesn't really always rely on the producers. If you have a distributor, he's going to start pinpointing. This one is not good. This one because of this. This one because of that. I prefer this one. And the other then thing I just wanted to add was that uh, an interesting... 
this business evolves, it's continuing to evolve. There's a big question mark as to how many people are really going to be sitting in c cinemas. And, uh, and in fact, my hope is that everybody's going to go, oh my God, that was such a great thing when we used to go to the cinema and see it on the... Oh! Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Young. I still can't get up. <laughs> That's an actor. That's a, a scene. <laughs> I, are you going to trust it again? I, I don't think I'm going to trust no. this chair. Replace it. Casting. <laughs> mm -hmm. One of the things that's slightly contested is that some actors have not very well known, but may have. 100,000, 200,000 followers. There's no marketing department anywhere in the world that doesn't understand, hmm, mm -hmm. we can either spend this money throwing it out there, or actually we can employ this actor who's going to be so happy to announce on his Twitter feed that he's doing this film and here's a, here's a shot of me in my wig and, you know, on the set, that person is doing the work of a publicist and a merchant better than anybody else. He's got 200,000 people that are dedicated to him, that love him, that follow him, and he's making this movie. What's the name of the movie? So the idea of, oh, just some marketing department saying, oh, this is how we do it, this is not the case anymore. People are far less impotent in the... If you have... If you're an actor, you're getting a following, it's not, oh, I was in this movie. It's, I have 200,000 people that read me every single day. I'm a worthwhile person to be in this film. So I just add that as, you know, a contemporary moment that we live through now. And mm -hmm. just to add, you added, you put that in the contract, that if he comes to Malta, he has to tweet. <laughs> and he has to tweet about the film and how many tweets he has to do. You're right. And even when the film is released, it's right. part of the contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. One, uh, well, we moved a bit from the subject, but I had a question for uh, Trevor. I, I, would I like saw to you in a cafe the other day, actually, I think. Which one? Uh, Angels. Master Scala. Really? Anyway, uh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you look very familiar. I don't know. Maybe I have an evil twin. Um, yeah, my question was, uh, because now we've been talking a lot about, like, you are experienced people, so obviously you know the higher spheres. But I have a question for someone who is way more entry level. I would like to know, um, because like when you write a script, then the next step would be creating your team. How, as an entry level person who doesn't have already um, a TV channel that is working behind them, how do you create a team that is going to work together? What do you mean by team? Are you saying as a screenwriter and sitting and writing your script? No, I mean after, when you want to actually make it, happen. Make it into, yeah. So then w w it isn't a question of, you know, it's a step thing. You're, you, you want to find a producer, <laughs> somebody that can get you into the room and, and, and be able to take the pro... It's like a conveyor belt, you know, and it's like, oh, then, then these people get involved and then these people get involved. The good thing and the reason I started in this business and why I've enjoyed it for my career mm -hmm. is that it seemed to me that it was a business that had no set rules. There was no ceiling. Nobody was going to say, mm, you didn't get a PhD, I'm not sure you could. No, everybody starts at the same level. Everybody has the ability to climb those ladders and go down those snakes and all of that stuff. So never ever think, oh, I'm just a beginner or it's just a multi-story. It's like, am I creative? Am I making something interesting? Am I wanting, am I really keen to tell this story? And trust me, I always say, don't go to anybody in your family. Don't ask your mum to read it because she's going to go, oh, are you sure you should be doing this? Darling? Or don't go to your best friend or your boyfriend who's going to go, so you think you're going to be a writer? No, keep away from all of those people. Have them as your emotional support. Write what you want to write. Then identify people, every single television show, Every single film you see has a list of names. Freeze it. Write down that name. Look them up. Who are they? Oh, he was, he's Maltese. I thought it sounded like a Maltese name. Oh, that's a little bit of a link for me. I'm a Maltese writer. You're a, 
whatever it may be. So do your homework. Don't sit there thinking, oh, I have this great idea, but I'll never be able to get it made. Everybody is an expert. We have all, everybody in this room has watched tens of thousands of hours of film and television. We're all experts. We all know what we had a thing in the networks was a, the shit click factor, which is you're watching something and you go, this is shit, click, and you just move on. You know what that is instinctively as an audience because you've been doing it consciously and subconsciously your whole life watching movies. So you know what you like. Do you have the passion to really tell a story? Do you have something original to say? You will find the right people. You will find someone that goes, hey, I'm only a junior producer, but I love your idea. I know this other producer. I can, I can get it there and I'll become a producer. So everybody's moving up the ladder. The so, so just enjoy it. And, and don't think of yourself as the, everybody's a little person in this game. Everybody starts like, I wonder if that's an idea. I wonder if that would work. Thank you, Trevor. Are there any other questions? Yes. Maybe a question for the three of you. Do you have a preference if it's um, an original story or an adaptation of a literature work or maybe a story based on historical or true events? Maybe connected to the Maltese context as well. I think we're talking about trends. I think the trends nowadays is to uh, adapt from comics. So right. you see a lot of comic companies, not just Marvel and DC, that are actually being bought for, for, their, uh, for their library. And uh, it's always a, a great idea because as a comic, it has been tested out in the market, so you know where, where it stands. Uh, for me personally, I like, I don't know, I mean, I, I don't actually have a preference, it's just if it's a good story, it's a good story. So that's, that's what I go for. If uh, someone is pitching to me and I like the story, I, li I just like the story, I connect to it. Of course, I, I don't connect to everything. There are some things that I personally like, it sometimes it works, it, it, it has to do with taste. So, and I think it's, I'm, uh, I, mean, I think I'm like everyone else. When I used to, when I used to work uh, for the American company, that was different because that was, I had particular goals that I needed to reach and we had particular genres that we need to look for. We, need, we needed material for those, for, for those things. If we were working for Sony Lifetime, I knew what I, what I needed. But now as I am now, it's just uh, what I like. So it's just about taste. The only thing I was going to add is that um, sometimes books are wonderful to adapt because it's there. The blueprint is there and you can just go with it. Um, the old idea used to be that if you had a very successful book and it had been a big bestseller, then it must become a feature film because it's a, such a big piece. And time and time again, what happened is that it would be a big book but it actually couldn't, it, to distill it down into just a feature length piece actually diminished the literary source. So one of the things I always used to love was finding a big book and saying to the writer, I know you want to do this as a feature, but if you have six hours to tell your story, this, then we can really enjoy the narrative. We can really explore all. We don't have to be cutting things out to see if we can get this into those 90 minutes. And often that was a great selling point for a writer who was worried, how are they going to reduce this into that length? But that they, so some of those mini series have a wonderful ability to really make a big book a, a real um, event. Joseph, what about you? I agree with um, Jean, it's, a story is a story. If you're touched by the story, it's worth developing it into a film or a series for an audience to see it. I like uh, original work because it's always interested me. However, I myself has developed a, a screenplay out of a book. 
There are certain books that are written that are so beautiful and moving and they should be told in a feature film format or a mini series for whatever platform. So, you know, it goes like John was saying, it's about the story. If the story is there, the characters are moving and it can touch an audience in one way or another, yeah, it should be made. Any other questions? No? So, before we conclude, I have one final question to the three of you. Um, if you can, just be concise and uh, answer it in a, in a minute, if possible. So, the question is this. What one change or introduction would you like to see in the industry to ensure that film in Malta continues to be successful internationally? I'll start with you, Jean-Pierre. One thing is, is, is very difficult. Uh, I think, I, I think the, 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 the only thing that can actually work is, is to have uh, a clear vision and to have a number of fragmented parts working together. For me, which is PBS, Film Commission, and University. And unless we have those working together, it will be very difficult to actually have any form of success. And I'm not saying an immediate success. It's a long-term plan that is needed. Thank you, Trevor. I, I, I absolutely second what you're saying. It's a small place. There are important elements. University, film committee, they have to be able to talk together and have a shared goal. And that goal is to make this island a place of indigenous as well as import production and that seems like a completely legitimate and uh, a, a, and achievable goal but it definitely as you say it needs all of those people to say yeah we'll we'll help you make this work joseph yeah th this morning i went to see <clears throat> mr johan greg talk about the film commission's uh, vision for the future and they talked about enhancing the uh, film fund which is a great thing, I think, because there are so many filmmakers here and they need that support, they need that help. Um, talked about creating a film school here for up and coming uh, filmmakers. I think that's brilliant. And um, post-production facilities. Malta needs good post-production facilities where producers don't have to go elsewhere to do post-production, but they can do it here on the island. I know there are a couple of very good companies here but um, I think Malta is also investing in having like, something at the, um, at the film studios, which is pretty cool. And um, yeah, I think those are great goals. I'm glad I heard them this morning. Jean-Pierre, Trevor, Joseph, thank you once again for being with us tonight and sharing your experiences. Good evening to everyone and to everyone who was watching us through our social media platform. Thank you once again. It seems like it's gotten colder.